Hello, and welcome to the launch of the new IEA special report on coal in net zero transitions. I'm Jethro Mullen, editor in chief in the IEA's communications team. And for today's event, I'm joined here in Paris by IEA executive director, Dr. Fatih Birol and IEA chief energy modeler, Lara Kotzi. And then joining us live from the SDG7 pavilion at COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt, we have IEA chief energy economist, Tim Gould. For today's event, Dr. Birrell will make some opening remarks, and then Ms. Kotze and Mr. Gould will present the key findings of the new report. We'll then take some questions from journalists. For the journalists taking part in this press webinar, we invite you to submit your questions via the Q&A function in the Zoom. You can do this at any point during the presentation, and we'll also take a two-minute break right after the presentation for you to submit your questions. And with that, I'll hand over to our Executive Director, Dr. Fatih Birrell. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Jethro, and uh, uh, dear colleagues, it is a great uh, pleasure to have uh, this launch of the IES major report on coal in net zero transitions. We are uh, having uh, this uh, launch uh, both in uh, Sharm El Sheikh, uh, our colleague uh, Mr. Tim Gould is uh, there, and uh, together with uh, my colleague Mrs. Uh, Lara uh, uh, Kozi, we are going to uh, present some of the findings of our study from IE headquarters in Paris. So, coal in net zero transitions. This is a, a major issue, and today, dear colleagues, 15th of November, I would say, is a very important milestone in global coal transitions. Because today, we got the very news uh, from a G20 meeting in Bali uh, that the uh, Indonesian government together with the U.S., Japanese, and uh, several European governments, and as well as several uh, financial institutions, agreed on a program, on a deal, on a so-called JETP, in other words, uh, Just Energy Transition Partnerships, which will help Indonesia, a country whose economy relies heavily on coal to move away from coal, having a cleaner energy future, but in a just and secure way. So in my view, uh, this is a real testament of international cooperation. It does work. It shows that, and I am very happy to see that this JETP, Just Energy Transition Program in Indonesia worked out. There is an agreement between the uh, leaders of uh, uh, governments uh, uh, in the countries I mentioned to you, but especially to the Indonesian uh, uh, government. We are very happy to hear that news. But at the same time, we are not only happy, we are very proud at the International Energy Agency because this agreement just Energy Transition uh, Partnership for Indonesia is based on International Energy Agency's roadmap for Indonesia to net zero by 2050. We have prepared a special report for Indonesian energy sector, the entire energy sector, how it can transform itself to net zero 2050 and of course there was a special focus on uh, electricity generation and coal and I was uh, very happy to release this report at the G20 uh, energy ministers meeting together with Indonesian uh, minister, energy minister Tasrif. So we are very happy because uh, at the IEA we make a, a, a lot of uh, reports, provide advice uh, to governments, and we are uh, uh, extremely happy when we see that our uh, work 
our analysis provides such important outcomes addressing the one of the major problems of the uh, global energy system uh, today, which is uh, climate change. So I would like to here congratulate all my colleagues who put a lot of effort uh, in order to prepare that uh, report uh, for Indonesia. And I also thank them for supporting the negotiations, long and uh, rather difficult negotiations with data analysis and advice uh, from uh, Paris. So after this, uh, 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 having a happy news, sharing this happy news uh, with you and underlining that how proud we are at the International Energy Agency, I wanted to uh, tell you why did we focus on coal in this report. In this report we are publishing uh, today, we focus on coal because coal is the most polluting fuel. It is a, a number one source of uh, carbon dioxide emissions when it comes to climate change. But at the same time, it is one of the main sources of uh, bad air quality in different countries. When you look at the list of the uh, countries with bad air quality, you will see a very strong resemblance of the share of high share of coal in those countries. So from an environmental point of view, both for climate change but for also air pollution, coal is a major uh, uh, challenge. So it is the reason when we look at the both global and the uh, local environmental issues, there is no way to reduce the share of uh, unabated coal if we wanted to reach our environmental goals, both globally, uh, international goals, but also national goals. Now, uh, some of the numbers, analysis from our work, I will tell you a few of them, are really striking. One of them is, it says the report, leave aside whether or not we will build new coal plants, only today's, the existing ones today, the coal plants, if they were to run in line with their economic lifetimes, as it has been, they have been running in other countries, in US, in Europe, uh, in Asia and elsewhere, if they run in line with their economic uh, lifetimes, 40, 50 years, even if we don't add one single new coal plant, we will exceed the 1.5 degrees uh, target. The emissions will be higher than that. So this is a major point that we all uh, need to, uh, I think, uh, take into consideration. The second one is that at this, uh, when I saw it, I was uh, uh, really taken back. It says in our report, today, when we look at the global coal consumption, 95% of global coal, coal consumption takes place in the countries where they have net zero commitments. So there is an issue there. On one hand, you are going to have a net zero commitment. You declare it. You publicize it. You tell the other uh, governments and around the world. On the other hand, you have uh, the coal uh, consumption in uh, your uh, country. Of course, we know very well the difficulties, the challenges that the, especially the emerging countries are facing today. Because they want to have a secure energy system, affordable uh, prices, and in uh, many cases they have a, a, a major coal fleet which is providing significant amount of their electricity generation. So it is the reason in this uh, report uh, we uh, not just say what needs to happen, but also how it should happen. What are the pragmatic solutions here? On one hand, reducing the share of coal substantially, but on the other hand, those countries will have secure and affordable 
uh, uh, energy. So we are uh, coming with some pragmatic solutions. Of course, we have a major team at the IEA working on this. Let uh, my uh, able colleagues, Mrs. Lara Kozi and uh, Tim uh, Gould, but we also uh, sought the advice, guidance of several experts around the world. We build a high-level advisory group led by uh, Michael uh, Bloomberg, the Special Climate Envoy of United Nations, being the chair and the vice chair being the uh, Minister Tasrif from Indonesia, Energy Minister, and also uh, uh, Minister Teresa uh, Ribera from uh, Spain, and several other uh, experts, government uh, uh, leaders, and also financial uh, industry executives, and they have uh, helped us uh, a lot uh, in order to provide our uh, report. And my colleagues, uh, Laura Cozy and Tim Gould, will share with you some of the uh, other uh, findings. Now, another point uh, I wanted to highlight uh, to you is the new financing of uh, coal uh, plants. So, uh, we are very keen to see that the uh, international financing uh, of coal plants uh, need to be uh, slowly but surely stopped. Otherwise, it will be uh, very difficult uh, to reduce the emissions from coal to the level that are in line with our uh, emission uh, targets, including the 1.5 uh, uh, degrees target. And our numbers show that today, 175 gigawatt uh, of uh, coal plants are under construction. And uh, adding to those power plants would make the challenge even more uh, difficult. But what do we do with the current ones? First of all, we think uh, early retirement is uh, a way to go, as uh, we have now uh, uh, presented in our Indonesia Net Zero uh, Roadmap a few months uh, ago, but uh, also repurposing to use the coal plants uh, only at a time when you have a need for it and otherwise rely on low cost, economically viable uh, renewable uh, generation, solar, wind, hydropower, and this will be the, uh, one of the key uh, solutions uh, uh, here. And uh, I imagine always on the power generation because power generation is the main source of uh, coal emissions. On one hand, it's a big challenge, but at the same time, in the uh, electricity generation, power generation, we have readily available alternatives uh, to uh, coal, such as the renewables, such as in some countries, uh, uh, nuclear power. But the other part, about 30% of the uh, coal emissions come from the industrial sector. It is a bit more challenging because you do not yet readily available uh, low cost uh, alternatives there and it is one of the reasons why as we highlight in our uh, report there is a need to push uh, low carbon hydrogen uh, carbon capture and storage as uh, solutions perhaps i will finish by uh, two other points uh, from our uh, report uh, one of them is the uh, the people people who are going to be affected from uh, the uh, current uh, uh, transition uh, programs away from coal. And uh, we know that in many countries, coal is an important source of employment. Yes, clean energy transitions will create a, a lot of new employment opportunities, but uh, perhaps uh, the new job opportunities will be created in different part of the country vis-a-vis -vis where you may lose jobs uh, as a result of coal transition. So therefore, it is uh, very important, as we highlighted in our report, to support to uh, local communities and the people who could be 
negatively impacted uh, from the coal transitions. And we have seen several good examples around the world, which has been done. It is highlighted in our uh, report, some good examples, successful examples, how you train or assist uh, this, uh, uh, the local communities and people. And as we highlight in our report, uh, from uh, all the countries, uh, uh, we see a need for coal transition only a few of them have plans uh, how to support uh, the, uh, uh, the people who may lose their jobs and communities who could be negatively affected. My last point, uh, uh, dear colleagues, is uh, that the, the investment and the financing. So, uh, of course, uh, the, there are uh, two ways to uh, look at it, two options. One of them is the private financing. Uh, the, uh, if the countries uh, who would like to uh, uh, go away uh, from uh, coal would provide the a right incentive, right regulatory framework for the private sector, domestic or international, uh, would be an important source of financing. Having said that, looking at the borrowing costs in those uh, countries, especially developing uh, countries, uh, it may not be the uh, a secure way of just looking at the private sector. In my view, there is an a important economic and moral obligation to have international financing uh, here. And our numbers uh, show that uh, we need between now and 2030, 150 billion US dollars. 150 billion US dollars uh, international financing in order to support a, a transition away from coal in a secure and uh, affordable uh, way. So uh, this is uh, important. This is a job for the advanced economies, international financial institutions, uh, 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 multilateral development banks. And uh, in the absence of that, in the absence of this support, to expect the uh, advanced uh, economies, in the absence of their support, to expect that the emerging countries, developing countries, would move away from coal in a timely manner, may be on the optimistic and the unfair side. So therefore, international financing is important. And I will stop where I started. Uh, the, the jet P of Indonesia is a very good uh, uh, news uh, for everybody and uh, uh, perhaps a model uh, for inspiration for other uh, countries. And here I would like to uh, pass the uh, floor uh, to my colleague uh, Lara Kozi, who together with Tim Good uh, uh, managed this work, led this work. Thank you very much, Lara, also for this and also for the Indonesia Net Zero uh, Roadmap. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Birol. It's uh, my pleasure now to uh, take you with, uh, with Tim Gould uh, through some of the uh, in-depth findings of, of this report. Um, Dr. Birol framed the issue in a, in a, perfect, uh, uh, in a perfect manner. Uh, there is no pathway that avoids climate change and actually avoids uh, uh, local pollution issues that uh, uh, does not tackle emissions from uh, coal. However, when you look at the uh, realities uh, of the numbers nowadays, uh, despite conflicting narratives of uh, coal being in an imminent decline or uh, experiencing a renaissance, uh, the truth is that coal has been in a rather stable level uh, for the past decade and remains the largest source of uh, uh, CO2 emission uh, globally. Now, uh, this for us is uh, uh, very much uh, a symbol, probably the most visible symbol of the challenge of aligning uh, uh, the world's climate action with uh, the ambition. And clearly the finding that 95% of those emissions, 95% of those coal use are actually occurring today in countries that have pledged to reach net zero within this century. Now, uh, the global number hides the complexity and the concentration of uh, uh, coal use and emission uh, today. For this reason, we have uh, actually devised uh, a, an index that tries to assess 
for which countries coal transitions are going to be more complex than others. So this index looks at the number of things. It looks at how coal is embedded in coal uses, how much coal participates in the economy of uh, the country. It looks at how young or old is uh, the coal asset. And when we look at all of this, uh, um, we find a number of countries, uh, mostly advanced economies, in which uh, the uh, coal use has been in decline for the past several year, years and for which we find that there is uh, a modest dependency on coal and a modest difficulty in the coal transition. Those accounts for around 20% of coal use in the world. Then we move on to countries where uh, coal is in more important f in terms of uh, their well-being, their, their growth, the economic growth. Uh, we have examples here from advanced and emerging economies, and those countries account for around 5% of global uh, coal use. And then we find seven countries for which transitions are going to be multifaceted, difficult, as coal is very much embedded, not only uh, in their energy system, it's embedded in their economy, and they have relatively young uh, coal assets. Now, the two key messages here are the following. Uh, we have basically a handful of countries, around 20, that account for 90% of coal use and emissions globally. So it's not about uh, 190 countries, it's about 20 countries. And in fact, the ones through which, in which we need to concentrate the most are the seven there for which transitions are going to be the most difficult. The good news that today we heard is actually that Indonesia scores the highest among those uh, coal transition exposure index, has managed very successfully to agree on a JET-P, South Africa but there as well, so we see ways of going forward. What are then the key pieces to put together to move and accelerate the transitions? We identify four key pieces. One is about people, one is about technology, deployment and innovation, and the third is about finance. I will take you through the first two, and Tim Gould then will take you through the following two. Let's look at people. Dr. Birol mentioned that uh, at the very outset, we have actually uh, around five million workers in coal mining and another million working in coal transportation. And you see here where they are uh, located. Now, in many cases, these uh, uh, coal workers are not in coal communities will not necessarily appear very much in the global accounting because those are really concentrated jobs and appear only when you look uh, at uh, a very, very uh, fine granular geographical level. So we have here, for example, um, Pumalanga in South Africa, where you have basically one in 10 people there that are related uh, to coal. East Kalimantan, similar situation in, in, in Indonesia. Shanxi province in China. So we need to work with those people. Our executive director says all the time, emissions don't have passports, but these 5 million workers do, and we need to work with them to make this transition happen. Now, what is the catch point here? Catch point is that only 4% of countries and communities where those workers are located have put in place, place what we would consider comprehensive just transition policies. So this is an essential piece to move the transition forward and is lagging behind. Maybe two key points here to highlight. Dr. Birol mentioned in the clean energy transition, there will be many jobs created, and we find that there are going to be many jobs created, for example, in the mining sector of critical minerals. And we did an analysis locating where those mines are and where those current uh, um, coal workers are located. And what we find is around 40% of those coal workers live in proximity of uh, critical mineral deposits. So retraining for those, for example, in the critical mineral sector is certainly something to look at very carefully. Another point that we look at carefully is actually the retirement age and the profile of those workers. And what we find that even when we look at uh, what countries have pledged, we may need to consider uh, ways to support some early retirement. And the assessment of how much money this would cost is within 10 to 20 billion in terms of wages over the remainder of the lifetime of those workers. 
Now we move on to uh, what is the critical issue that Dr. Birol mentioned. Assets are young, 15 years old coal assets for power generation in Asia, similar 16 years old steel plants again uh, in Asia, the average age. Now, if those continue to operate as we have done uh, in advanced economies over the past century, what we find is that uh, we will uh, use the entire remaining 1.5 degree budget and we will tip uh, towards the, uh, our global climate pledge. So we need to move towards uh, uh, cutting at least 100 gigatons of emissions. This is what actually countries have pledged. And in fact, we should move even further, stopping basically emissions for coal by uh, 2040. And this is even not considering the over 175 gigawatts that are being built today. What is the technology solution? We look at the power sector here. What we need to do is uh, the following. First of all, advanced economies accelerate what they're doing, they're phasing out and moving away to, out of coal. Those plants are in most cases uh, old and we find that uh, the solutions are there and we do see a very significant increase in the scale up of renewables. We found those in our recent World Energy Outlook. We need to decline uh, generation from unabated coal and at the same time scale up the solutions. I think this is where we really do think that the JetP for Indonesia is a role model that uh, really provides a pathway to scale up solar and wind, the critical, the critical solution needed for, uh, to substitute uh, this generation that would have come uh, from coal. There are other solutions there. You see them all listed there. They include also uh, retrofitting uh, of some young coal-fired power plants with CCOS, with hydrogen and ammonia. Another important pa pa point here is that we don't only need to substitute generation. Coal provides an essential system service. And in some cases, as you can see here, actually, you may want to keep your coal-fired power plants longer just to make sure that the lights don't go off. And for system capacity, the set of generation techno the, of, of technologies that uh, is needed is actually a bit different from what you see from uh, generation. In this case, as Dr. Birol mentioned, we are really looking at scaling up technologies that exist already, but the challenge for, the, for industry is different and Tim Gould will take you through those. From um, Shama Sheikh, and uh, greetings from, uh, from COP27. Um, I'm gonna take you through a slightly different story here uh, when it comes to industrial coal use, uh, because if the watchword for the power sector is renewables, it's battery storage, the watchword in industry is all about innovation, because many of the solutions that we're gonna need to reduce coal emissions in industry are not yet um, market ready. And if you look at the way that we reduce industrial emissions to 2050 and our net zero emissions by 2050 scenario, you can see that more than half of those are to do with coal. And some of those technologies, whether it's in the steel industry or in cement, um, bits of the carbon capture, utilization and storage chain, bits of the low emissions hydrogen chain, and um, some other industrial processes, we need to move to bring those to market ready status over the next 10 years. And because you can see on the right hand side of the screen that more than half of those solutions are still at prototype or demonstration phases. It's very much the responsibility of advanced economies in our view to bring those uh, nascent technologies to market. Uh, but let's be aware that the majority of the deployment will need to be in emerging and developing economies. And the final issue that we wanted to touch upon in this presentation relates to issues around financing and investment. And I wanted to start the financing discussion by looking at today's power plants and the amount of capital that remains to be recovered from those initial investments in coal. Our analysis suggests that there is more than $1 trillion of capital that remains to be recovered um, in around 1,400 gigawatts of coal-fired plants um, that are that and say, well, so what if these coal asset owners own money, um, oh, lose money, sorry. Um, but in practice, this is a problem 
for coal transitions because that unrecovered capital represents a powerful constituency that will be resistant to change. And in many cases, um, those plants are shielded from market competition. So the cost advantages of renewables don't come through uh, as strongly as we would wish. And in some cases, they are also protected by contractual mechanisms that guarantee a certain level of operation. So we need some innovative financial solutions to help reduce or remove this roadblock and ensure that plants are put to, on a credible pathway towards retirement repurposing or retrofit. And a key metric uh, to understand that is on the screen. It's what was the weighted average cost of capital? So what was the cost of capital that these coal plant owners have faced when they took their uh, investment decisions? And that will affect you know, how that uh, investment is returned um, over time. Now, there's a very large variation as you look at the cost of capital across different plants. Uh, we did a plant by plant analysis of, uh, of coal uh, around the world. Um, but we found that the average, the weighted average cost of capital, the average across all, they return their capital over, over time. So if we look to the picture in within 10 years, with continued operation, around an extra 300 gigawatts of capacity would have returned that initial capital to the asset owners. And that can be a moment when it's much easier to move these plants towards retirement or to repurpose them to run more flexibly. But if we were able to refinance some of today's coal plants at a lower rate, so perhaps by, by three percentage points lower than the initial rate, then that would also accelerate the, the pace at which that capital is returned to owners. And it would open up a pathway within 10 years towards retirement or phasing down the operation of around 720 gigawatts of coal capacity. And that's around a third of the existing coal plant fleet. And there are many innovative financial mechanisms that are being discussed by multilateral development banks and governments around the world that can facilitate that kind of change. And those mechanisms can be combined with support for building up also the clean energy alternatives. And the final slide, it's around the overall cost of this. Of course, we shouldn't just talk about the investment costs. We also need to have in mind the very substantial savings in terms of fuel costs over time, but also um, the system cost reductions that this transformation in the energy and the electricity sector uh, represents. Um, and what we zoom in on here is the amount that's required in emerging and developing economies outside China this decade. Uh, because for us, that's a critical indicator of the amount of international financial support that would also be uh, needed. And you can see that in a scenario in which we hit the national climate targets, um, they would need to be a And you can see that the majority of that would need to go into renewables. And if we look at what would happen in a scenario that is consistent with a 1.5 degree uh, goal, then that amount goes up to well over uh, a trillion dollars. The majority of this takes place in the electricity sector, which is why renewables and other low emissions fuels, uh, low emission sources are, are so important. But you'll see also there's a very important role in industry for efficiency and electrification and also for low emissions hydrogen and uh, CCUS. And in our estimation, emerging and developing economies require international capital to cover around one third of that total investment. So public international actors such as multilateral development banks can play a very important catalytic role to bring that private capital into uh, these kinds of investments. And that's why I think this, the JetP announcement today made with Indonesia is of such strategic importance for showing the way to having a, a sort of happy marriage of that international assistance and support uh, with a, a strong domestic commitment uh, to change. So uh, before we go to your questions, uh, just a few uh, conclusions to, um, to have in mind. Um, at the IEA, we do look at all fuels, all technologies, and we certainly recognize that meaningful transitions need to affect 
emissions from all fossil fuels and all sources. Um, but coal does require particular attention uh, because as the executive director made clear, if we do nothing, then the continued operation of today's coal fired power plants and industrial facilities, that will on its own tip us over the 1.5 degree limit. The second point is that we cannot think of coal transitions in isolation. We have to think about what are we doing to replace the energy services that coal provides today, but we need to replace it, of course, in a secure, clean, and affordable way. A third point is that there is no single technology that has the answer. Renewables do a lot of heavy lifting, but particularly when we look outside the power sector, uh, we need a range of technology solutions, some of which require continued innovation, innovation to bring to market. And then the fourth point is that coal transitions are, have to be all around people. And um, coal value chain by its nature is much more labor intensive than many other uh, value chains in the energy sector. Um, so we need to make sure that coal dependent communities uh, and regions are very much at the center of this conversation about uh, coal transitions. And finally, we, we just need integrated thinking about these challenges. We need to cover all parts of the picture and we need strong international financial support. This is a global effort uh, and there's no more important task in energy transitions than to get coal transitions right. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, we now have a bit of time to take some questions from journalists. So we invite the journalists in attendance to send your questions through the Q&A function of the Zoom as quickly as possible if you haven't done so already, since time is tight uh, for this event uh, on, the, on the Egypt side. Um, and please do mention your media outlet along with your question. Um, we'll take a one or two minute break um, to give you a chance to enter your questions and we'll be right back. We're back. Um, thank you very much uh, to the journalists for the questions. We're going to cover as many of them as we can in the time we have left. Um, so uh, the first one is uh, from Nicole Macedo from uh, Gas Matters. Is coal the answer to deal with the current short-term energy crisis in Europe brought about by Russia's war? How can we avoid a continued coal resurgence over the next couple of winters? Um, and a similar question is on this is how can you call for a transition away from coal when European countries are turning on mass back to coal to keep the lights on. Isn't this um, hypocritical? Uh, I think uh, Tim Gould uh, in uh, Sharm El Sheikh is going to take this first question. Over to you, Tim. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a very good question and it's indeed one that's being discussed uh, in the meetings rooms of, of uh, Sharm El Sheikh as well. Um, I think the important thing to have in mind that in times of crisis, people will, people will look to any, of any energy that's available, whether it's sustainable or not, and you do see that around the world. But I think we need to keep this story of a, a sort of coal comeback in, in, in context. 
and um, because IA analysis shows very clearly that the uh, additional generation from coal in 2022 is of comparable size to the increase that we're also expecting this year from wind and from solar. And after 2022, as a result of the reactions from governments to today's crisis and the additional support that they are providing for um, transitions, and because of the cost competitiveness of those renewable solutions, in our view, um, we do see that renewables growth is lasting and permanent, while growth in coal is short-lived and quickly turns into a structural decline. So by the end of this decade, renewables uh, renewable generation is around 90% higher in our under today's policy settings than, uh, than it is today, while coal is already moving down from, from, from where it is today. So I think we have to keep in mind that temporal perspective, the short term versus the longer term, and the, the need to align over the longer term our energy security needs with the imperative to reduce emissions. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, we now have some questions on the uh, on the JetP, the Just Energy Transitions Partnership that uh, has been mentioned a few times already. Um, so one of them is about uh, what was the IEA's involvement in the Indonesia uh, Just Energy Transition Partnership that was announced today. Um, and then uh, and a second question on that um, was who do we th who do you think will be next? Sorry, this is from Junior Isles um, from the Energy Industry Times. Um, who do you think will be next and which country is next on the IEA's agenda? I think um, Laura Kotze is going to take the first question on IEA involvement in uh, uh, the Indonesia JetP and then Dr. Birol will talk about what comes next. So over to you, Laura. Thank you very much, Jetro. So um, we work with Indonesia uh, as basically uh, Glasgow last year, where the executive director agreed with the Minister Tazrif to work together on understanding uh, fact-based uh, transition of the global energy sector uh, to reach the ambitious net zero by 2060 Indonesia put out. We work with the, uh, the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources very closely of Indonesia with our experts here across, across the IEA over many, many months. Uh, and uh, we were very happy that uh, uh, at the G20 Energy Ministers meeting, uh, Dr. Birol signed with the Minister Tazrif uh, a, a joint document uh, um, uh, with highlighting the key aspects of, uh, of the, the, uh, the energy sector transition to, um, to net zero. Uh, so we, we certainly uh, participated actively with uh, fact-based uh, uh, analysis and supporting uh, uh, all sides of the negotiations and we can only celebrate together with them this uh, amazing success today. Uh, on my part, again, I, would, I want to, I cannot stop myself, but uh, congratulate my colleagues who work on this Indonesian Net Zero uh, Roadmap because it is uh, a modus organization uh, like the IEA. It's not every day that you see that a work you have done is having a, such an important impact on the international energy and uh, climate scene. Who is next? I think there are many countries uh, that we are uh, working uh, together. But uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to work with Indonesia uh, this year is not only that uh, we have uh, an excellent uh, working relationships with the Indonesian government as a member of the IEA uh, family. Uh, Indonesia was the G20 uh, uh, president and we hope that uh, we will work uh, next year uh, with uh, India and therefore uh, afterwards with Brazil. Uh, to provide uh, some insights uh, in order to help them how they can reach uh, their climate uh, commitments. Thank you, Dr. Birol. So um, we're running a bit short on time. I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, uh, one is, if you can give one message to climate negotiators at COP based on this report, what would it be? Um, and then from, uh, from the South China Morning Post, um, from Yu Jie Zhu, um, can you share some comments on China's massive coal retirement? Would developed nations expect China to fund retirement of its own coal power plants, uh, or they would also financially help China to retire its coal fleet uh, for the sake of global warming? 
Um, I think Dr. Birrell is going to look at these uh, last two questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jethro. First of all, the China question, I should start. Uh, uh, I was also in, uh, in, in Egypt, COP27, a few days ago, and one of my best meetings was with the, uh, the Chinese special envoy, uh, Xi Shenhua. And uh, I share with him uh, our uh, views about the Chinese electricity generation. Our numbers show that the, the, in the next 10 years, the growth in the Chinese renewable and nuclear electricity generation is higher than the Chinese electricity demand growth. So it means China, first of all, can meet its growing electricity demand growth uh, only with the clean electricity sources. And what to do with the uh, uh, existing ones? Uh, it is important that they are uh, slowly but surely, in some cases even faster, they go to uh, retirement. And the ones which are not retired should be used as a, a source of secure supply when there is a need uh, to be used, not with the high utilization rate. So uh, China today uh, is a country, on one hand, a leader in terms of the clean energy in solar, wind, electric cars, hydropower, uh, and others. But at the same time, a major uh, a country with a lot of emissions, a number one emitting uh, of the world. So therefore, there is a must for China to reduce its emissions from coal as soon as possible. Uh, the last question is, uh, what if one advice to the COP negotiators uh, in uh, at COP today? I, 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 we share so many uh, advisors, but if I have to pick up one of them, given the today is uh, good news, we need more Indonesias. We need more jet piece uh, that we have for Indonesia today. We need the advanced economies to help the emerging countries especially those in Africa and elsewhere to help them to accelerate their clean energy transition. It's a job for the advanced economies, but also a job for the multilateral development banks and of course the, uh, the uh, domestic countries, the home countries uh, in the emerging world need to provide uh, the uh, framework in order to embarrass those investments and uh, support. So, more Indonesia's, more jet peace, our message from Paris to Sharm el-Sheikh. Thank you very much, Dr. Birol. That's all we have time for here. Um, we've had a lot of great questions, more than we can actually fit in. Um, so if any journalists have questions that didn't get answered during the Q&A that you'd like to follow up on, we invite you to reach out to our press office and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Can I, uh, Sure. Thank you, if I may. So uh, I just wanted to thank uh, to all the, uh, we see uh, many, many journalists uh, and uh, thousands of people watching around the world uh, this uh, event. Uh, but many thanks to colleagues uh, of uh, SE for All, hosting my colleague Mr. Tim Gould uh, in the Sharm El Sheikh for the generosity and uh, for the great cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Um, and just a reminder that our new special report, Coal in Net Zero Transitions, is available for free on our website. So do please go and take a look uh, if you haven't already. Um, and that's all for today. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>